One of the really interesting things about the deconstruction project was that all of the historic information we had showed that this log crib dam, which was built in 1904, stayed as a log crib dam with chinking, which is the material that shoved between the logs to make it waterproof, all through the operational period. In November 1942, after the new dam had been built, they tried to burn the log crib dam, and that didn't work very well. At some point, they covered the face of the log crib dam with concrete. We didn't know that they'd done it at all until 2010, totally to everyone's surprise during deconstruction. And the assumption is that they had to have done it after November 42, when they tried to burn it, but before they took away the coffer dam that they used to build the 1942 dam, because it would have been underwater. Sladen Construction, which had the job of taking this dam out, had a lot of trouble with the concrete encased log dam. It was a lot harder to remove than anybody expected. This really gives you a great view to understand how the 1941 dam was built. It's what's called a slab and buttress dam. We generally think of dams as being big, solid constructions, but it's a whole lot easier to pour a slab facing upstream that stops the water and then to support it by a series of what are called buttresses, those vertical concrete walls stiffened with tie bars so that they can take the full weight of the water pushing against the slab. Here you get the back view of the 1904 log crib dam with the back view of the 1941 dam just ahead of it. Both slab and buttress, one made out of concrete. These wooden planks were laid down on a log structure and that was how they contained the Rogue River in 1904. People have asked about the curve of the log crib dam, which is the original dam built in 0304. And my assumption is that a log crib dam made of a lot of little pieces is inherently not as stable as a monolithic dam. And so that curve actually provides additional strength. The force of the river driving against that semicircle of logs would drive the logs together into a more stable structure that could withstand the force of the road river. This gives you a really good idea of the concrete face that was attached to the log structure of the log crib dam before they took away the coffer dam that they used to build the 1942 dam. This is the fore bay where the water would come off the main channel of the river, go through a head gate, and these are the head gates at the head of the fore bay. These metal screens are called trash racks, and they're exactly what you think they are. They keep trash, usually logs, from coming into the fore bay and getting stuck in the turbines, which of course would be a big problem. This is the extension of the fore bay when they modified the Gold Ray powerhouse in 1905 to accommodate the larger turbines, they had to widen the forebay. These are the 1905 turbines, 42 inches in diameter. There are actually four of them, two to a unit. The wicket gates control the flow of water into the turbine. Here are the turbines being installed. The bar across the top of the turbines is the wicket gate control. And what it does is it turns, opens, and closes the water flow to the turbines. Those concrete casks are counterweights so that an operator doesn't have to fight the entire force of the road river when he's trying to open and close water flow into the turbines. 
One of the interesting things about Gold Ray is because it was so old and because some of the documentation didn't come until late into the process, we didn't realize that there were actually four turbines underneath. When we started to excavate and remove the silt that accumulated in the last 40 years, we exposed the first turbine. And we also exposed the weights for the wicket gate control. And they kept going off into space, and nobody really knew why they kept going out that way until we realized that there was actually another turbine connected, and that there were four turbines, not two. An operator up on the power floor turns this control valve for the wicket gate. This control takes the force turning that large wheel and magnifies it with gear ratios. That force is then transmitted through this drive shaft, through the wall of the building, down the side of the building through these control rods to another drive shaft that runs along the top of the turbines. Off of that drive shaft are a series of struts that connect down into the wicket gates located on either end of all four turbines and those function kind of like a camera shutter with little wings that open or close to control the flow of water into the turbines. The drive shaft coming off of the turbines connects to the lower pulley. The rope sat in those grooves 20 grooves, 1,600 feet of rope per unit, and then went up through the powerhouse and connected to the upper pulley. This is looking down from the power floor into the lower pulley bay. You'd go down this stairwell for maintenance. When it was operational, of course, it wouldn't be filled with water. In this shot, you can see both lower pulleys, one in the distance, slightly offset, and the rope hanging down from the upper pulley. Now we've turned around and we're looking back through the lower pulley bay from the other side in a cutaway view. The ropes go up to the upper pulleys on the power floor level. The upper pulley with its protective cover for both unit two and unit one, they're offset slightly so the ropes don't tangle. The drive shaft goes through the pulley, through the wall of the building. You can see the size of the drive shaft to power this massive generator. And then the 750 kilowatt generator the whole system, if you go from the start, the water goes through the turbines, the turbines spin the drive shaft, the drive shaft spins the lower pulley, the lower pulley transfers power to the upper pulley via 1,600 feet of braided rope, which then goes to another drive shaft and spins the generator and you get electricity out the other end. By 2010, Gold Ray was really a dream of another time. It had started out in 1904 as an exciting new world, the promise of electricity, the promise of industrialization and growth in the valley, and people were glad to see it built and excited to see it operate. Gold Ray was completed in 1904 and it did its job. It brought the valley into the modern era, it brought electricity to the bulk of the valley, it brought industry, and it brought excitement. It was bypassed by other larger hydroelectric facilities within 10 years of its construction. And for the last 80, 90 years, it sat on the road and was sort of a relic of the past. It's too bad that Gold Ray had to go completely, but time marches on and we learned a lot about Gold Ray by taking it down, probably more than we ever would have known had it just continued to stand there. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video, and I hope the next time you drive through Gold Hill along the Earl River, you'll look at that wide spot filled with granite and remember what used to be there.